All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome back again. Thank you all so much for coming over. We are back with Mr. Ball and top three stories that sound fake but are 100% real, part 16. The Flannel King himself. Again, make sure you guys are subscribed to his channel. This brother is great at what he do, is bringing us in in these stories. Uh, like I say, he keeps me on my P's and Q's, heads on the swivel, <laughs> you know, Um but again, appreciate you guys coming over and watching. Thanks for all the support. Shout out to all the good humans. Link is always is in the description for those who are asking. So we ain't going to waste no more time. Let's jump right into it. Sometimes the truth is stranger than fiction. And today we're going to look at three stories that demonstrate that. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you come to the right channel because that's all we do and we upload two or three times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please replace all of the like buttons Windex with olive oil. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's story. Windex stories. instead of olive oil. In January of 2015, a 27-year-old Texas man named George Pickering III suffered a massive stroke. He was immediately admitted to a hospital where he was put on life support and then doctors delivered some bad news to his family. It would turn out George was brain dead and they advised the family that realistically they should consider pulling George off of life support because it wasn't gonna do him any good. George's family was totally devastated by this news. In fact, George's father was so upset he just left the hospital altogether. And so in his father's absence, George's mother and brother wound up talking to doctors and saying that yes, we are prepared to pull George off of life support. After they consented to have this done, they put George on an organ donor list and then began making funeral plans. When George's father came back to the hospital later that day and found out his family had consented to have George pulled from life support, he was furious. Mm. He did not believe his son was just totally brain dead and there was no hope. He felt like they should at least try to give him a little bit more time to potentially give them a signal that he was okay. But George's mother and brother... Yeah, that's so tough, man. A lot of people don't like to see people suffering. Uh... It's extremely hard because, you know, everybody grieves differently, you know. So it's like some people are like, no, I, I, that's it. And other people are like, give him, give him more time. It's tough. It's tough. I know a lot of people have like, um, I've heard stories where people have like gotten divorces and just all types of stuff because of situations like this. So it's very, very serious more time to potentially give them a signal that he was okay. But George's mother and brother told George's father that they had spoken to the doctors and there was just no hope. There was no reason to delay this process. It was time. But George's father was totally not having it. He stormed out of the room and he found the doctors and he demanded they keep his son on life support just a little bit longer. But the doctors told him there really is no reason to do that. And in fact, all you're doing is jeopardizing the people that need his organs that are mm. waiting for this organ transplant and so really what we need to do is actually expedite taking him off of life support because that's the best thing to do right now george's father was so upset totally distraught he ran back to his son's room he laid over his son and he just held his hands and stared at him oh, and man. just prayed that his son would give him some sign that he was actually not brain dead but his son didn't and before long the doctors began filtering into the room to begin the procedure of removing his son from life support and when they came in the room george's father kind of snapped. He ran out of the room, he ran out of the hospital, he went out to his car and he got his gun and then ran back into the hospital, oh. back into his son's room and aimed the gun at the doctors and ordered them to stop what they were doing and leave the room immediately. And so the doctors had not actually begun removing George from life hey. support. So he's still on life support. And so once the doctors and everyone left the room, George's father walked over, he locked the door and then for the next several hours he just kept his gun aimed at the door as he laid over his son and just kept looking down in hopes that his son would give him some sign. That's pretty crazy. Like, I'm just trying to think of like security because I know there's been situations where people going in hospitals like that, you know. Mm. It was that easy to just go in there, like run out of there and run 
mm. for his son and just kept looking down in hopes that his son would give him some sign that he was not brain dead. And so finally, when the SWAT team arrived and was stacking up outside the door in the hallway, they began yelling into the room for George's father to put the gun down and let them come in. And George's father the whole time is just looking down at his son, hoping and praying that his son is just going to do something. And right as the SWAT team kicks in the door and comes into the room, George's father had reached down and grabbed his son's hand and his son squeezed his hand back. Oh. And as soon as his father felt that, he dropped the gun and he surrendered peacefully to the SWAT team. And then the SWAT team put George's father on the ground. And as he's being detained, George's father is yelling for the doctors to come in the room, my son is okay. And sure enough, when the doctors came in the room, George was okay. He was moving his hand, his eyes were open, he was making good eye contact, and before long, he made a totally full recovery. He would later be told that had his father not stepped in when he did and bought him those extra few hours on life support, George would have died. As for George's father, he was ultimately sentenced to 10 months in prison for his aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, but he and the rest of his family think what he did was certainly worth going to prison for. Uh... See, I, I, I know, I know, I know what he did <clears throat> was illegal. But damn, like, if he didn't hurt nobody, I, don't, I mean, I know it was only 10 months, but what he did and his son woke up, Oh man, that's a, that's a, oh, I need y'all comments on this one. That is a tough one, y'all. I get it. By law, what he did was not right, but I'm just saying it's, it's, I feel like it's so many people in the world who have done far worse and, and nothing happened. You know what I mean? That right there, he just saved his son's life. So. I mean, I'm like, yo, <laughs> 10 months, I don't care what it is. What time you giving me? My son is alive. That, ooh, that, that's a tough one. I need y'all to comment on that, please. In 1959, Ronald McNair was a very gifted nine-year-old African-American boy living in South Carolina. While he was good at virtually everything he tried, from music to athletics to schoolwork, the only thing that ever really grabbed his attention was outer space. And so as a nine-year-old child, he made the decision that one day he was going to become an astronaut. Wow. But he had no idea how to become an astronaut. And so he decided the first thing he would do would be to go to his library and take out some books on NASA the very famous organization that sends American astronauts to space. However, there was an issue with his plan. This library only served white patrons. It was a segregated library. Uh, Ronald knew go. this, but he figured, you know what? I'm a polite kid. I can get in there and get out before anybody notices me. But as soon as he walked into that library, everybody in there who were all white just stared at Ronald. Ronald could feel it, but he just kept his head down and he walked through the library, he got to the science section, he grabbed a couple books he wanted, and then he walked back to the counter and he put them up and he very politely asked the librarian, who was also white, if he could check these books out. And this librarian looks at him and says, young man, you better get out of here before I call the police. And Ronald at this point looks up at the librarian and thinks for a second and then just hops up onto her counter and sits there and says, okay, I'll wait for the police. The librarian was totally outraged and would would call the police and would call Ronald's mother. And before long, the police did show up and it was two white guys. They come inside and this librarian runs over to them and she's talking to them and she's pointing back over at Ronald, gesticulating that very clearly Ronald is the issue. That's why you've been called here. And the officers would be just totally annoyed by this librarian. And they would say to her, why don't you just let the kid take the books out? And the librarian was totally offended at this and began defending her decision to call the police instead of letting him take the books out. And 
and as she's defending herself, Ronald's mother comes running into the library. She runs over to her son to make sure he's okay. And then she looks up at the police officers and this librarian to try to figure out what's going on. And at this point, the police officers are just totally over it. And they turn to the librarian and they say, you know what, you really ought to let him take the books out. And then the officers just turned around and left. The librarian was not about to just let him take the books. She was still very upset. And so she storms over to Ronald's mother and she says to her, you shouldn't let your son come in here. And at this, Ronald's mother is looking at this librarian who's totally upset and she looks down at her son who's got his head down and then she notices the few books on the counter about space and she was aware of Ronald's love for outer space and she put together what had happened and after thinking about it for a moment she looks up at this librarian and she just says well since he's here already can he take out those books? He'll take good care of them. The librarian is still totally furious, but knows this is a losing fight. And so very reluctantly with a scowl on her face, she grabs the books and she jams them into Ronald's arms. Damn. And Ronald's mother nudges Ronald and says, what do you say? And Ronald, while holding all of his new books about NASA and space, looks up at the librarian and smiles and says, thank you, ma'am. And then he and his mom turn around and they leave. Ronald would go on to earn his PhD in physics from MIT, one of the most prestigious universities in the world and after graduation he was picked up by NASA to become an astronaut wow. and in 1984 Ronald went into outer space he was actually the second African-American to ever go into outer space and while he was in orbit apparently he played his saxophone for his crew and then in 1986 Ronald was chosen again to go on another mission to outer space but tragically 73 seconds after takeoff their space shuttle the Challenger exploded killing Ronald and the six other astronauts wow. on Following his death, the library in South Carolina that had tried to turn Ronald away for his skin color renamed themselves the Ronald McNair Life History Center. Well, look at that. Oh. That's one of those beautiful, sad type stories. Like, I mean, damn. That brother, when you're that young and you got your mind made up, and you feel like nothing's going to stop you from reaching that goal, man. Skies is the limit. And then you 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 go and do that, and then that happened. Oh, it's crazy, man. I forgot what year they said, but I don't want to get into that subject because that's a whole other animal there. But, wow. It, it's, it's like, a happy, sad ending. Like, shout out to him for accomplishing that, but damn. I'm pretty sure that's, I, I'm pretty sure I knew, but I didn't know who was on there. You know, like, when that happened, because, you know, that's always, like, making the news for sure. I already know this one will be crazy because there's so much time left. The United States formally entered World War II in December of 1941, following the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor in Hawaii by the Japanese. Roughly six months later, a 21-year-old Alabama native named Henry Irwin joined the Army Reserve. After nearly two years of additional military training, Henry was made into a radio operator and was assigned to a B-29 bomber. A B-29 bomber is this huge aircraft whose sole purpose is to drop bombs. And so in February of 1945, Henry and his B-29 bomber unit were sent to the Pacific to do just that, drop bombs on the Japanese. Two months after arriving, Henry's B-29 was tasked with being the lead bomber in a group attack on a Japanese chemical facility located about 125 miles north of Tokyo. Aside from just operating his radio inside of the B-29, occasionally Henry's job was to organize the other planes in the attack when their B-29 was the lead attacker. And so the way he would do this was by dropping a series of smoke bombs out of his plane, and then once they touched the ground and all the smoke was coming up, he would hop on his radio and communicate with the other pilots in his sortie and tell them to organize themselves off of this visual reference point on the ground. He would basically have them fly to certain positions relative to the smoke cloud. And so once all the pilots had been organized into proper formation, they would continue to their target and commence their bombing raid. For this mission, Henry was in his typical position right behind the front
front turret gun towards the front of the plane. When his pilot told him to start dropping smoke bombs, Henry did as he was told. And so he pulled the lever, which opened up a chute on the bottom of the plane, and all these smoke bombs began tumbling out of it. Now, as soon as he pulled that lever, all of these smoke bombs that were in that particular chute were ignited. They were on a timed fuse, mm. and so they would tumble out of the plane, and then before hitting the ground, they would ignite, and then smoke would start billowing out of them. But for some reason, after he pulled that lever, a couple of the smoke bombs fell out of the chute, but one of them kind of got turned around, and as it tumbled down, it kind of caught itself on the lip and bounced back up into the plane, and it struck Henry square in the face, shattering his nose, and then it ignited and literally lit Henry's face on fire, which instantly blinded him. Smoke oh. bombs are not considered lethal devices because they do not explode the way typical bombs do. However, make no mistake about it, you would would not want to be near a military grade smoke bomb when it went off. In order for it to emit that very thick and long lasting smoke that it does, the smoke bomb ignites a chemical fire within itself that burns extremely hot. And so when the smoke bomb came back inside the plane and ignited right in front of Henry, those chemicals landed on his face. And so that's why he caught on fire. And if that wasn't bad enough, the smoke bomb also filled the plane completely with smoke, making it impossible for the pilots to see anything. Despite his burning, shattered face, all Henry could think about was if he didn't get this smoke bomb off the plane in the next few seconds, they were all going to crash and die. So instead of trying to put out his burning face, Henry began feeling around on the ground for the smoke bomb, which again is basically like a fireball. And when he found it, he pulled it into his chest, trying to smother it as best as he could. And while his body completely engulfed in flames, Henry began low crawling his way towards the front of the plane where Man. he knew just by touch, there was going to be a window. And so as he agonizingly crawled, he's on fire. He finally gets to this window. He can feel it above him and he manages to lift the smoke bomb up and throws it out the window. And then afterwards, he collapses on the ground and he passes out completely on fire, fully expecting to die. A few seconds later, the smoke inside of the plane cleared because now the smoke bomb was gone. And the pilot who had put the plane on autopilot but did have to drop significantly in altitude because they were starting to stall, finally could see again and saw they were about 300 feet from hitting the water. And so he was able to pull back and get them out of their dive and he narrowly escaped crashing into the water and he turned around and began flying back to base. On this return, trip, the crew, who were unhurt, began assessing the damage, and they saw Henry on fire on the side of the plane, and so they rushed over and they put him out with a fire extinguisher, expecting him to be dead, but to their shock and horror, he was still alive, and so they gave him morphine for his pain and expected him to die any moment, but Henry didn't die. Instead, he was very cheerful on the flight all the way back to base, and he would what? ask each of his crew members if they were okay, and they would all say, yeah, I'm just fine, it's really you who we're concerned uh, about here. Yeah. When the pilot finally landed back at base, Henry's body had stiffened up so dramatically from being on fire that the doctors couldn't actually get him out of the plane's side door. And so they had to dismantle the side of the plane to get Henry That's out. Great. And so the doctors fully expected Henry was going to die basically any moment from his horrible wounds. Seems like everybody expected Henry to die, but Henry, he just, man doctors fully expected Henry was going to die basically any moment from his horrible wounds, but since he hadn't yet, they did everything they could to try to save him. They put him through dozens of surgeries, including one where they would try to remove the chemical flex from the smoke bomb that had embedded in his eyes. And since these chemicals combusted as soon as they made contact with oxygen, every time they pulled out one of these flex, it would burst into flames and very painfully burn Henry's eyes a little bit more. While Henry was undergoing all these surgeries, the rest of his B-29 crew immediately went to their commanding officer and said, you have to put Henry in for the Medal of Honor. The Medal of Honor is the highest award you can achieve in the U.S. military. After the commanding officer heard the story of what Henry had done, he agreed, and in record time, he got the paperwork processed and got Henry approved for this award. But there were no actual physical medals of honor on the island to actually present to Henry. And the officers and the rest of his crew were worried Henry would die before the actual medal was shipped out to the island to be given to him. And so the only medal of honor that was on this island was inside of a museum behind a glass case. And so one of the officers in Henry's crew went into the museum, shattered the case, took the display medal of honor and rushed to Henry's bedside and put it around his neck. And then after that, somehow Henry just didn't die. 
After dozens and dozens of surgeries, Henry actually regained sight in one of his eyes and regained the use of most of his body. Henry would later be asked in an interview what it was like to do this very heroic thing that he did. And he would say, well, you know, I only moved the bomb 13 feet, but 13 feet feels like 13 miles when you're, you're on, on fire. fire. Henry would go on to be honorably discharged from the military, and he would spend the next 37 years working closely with other burn victims, trying to keep them positive and optimistic about their recovery. He would also go on to have four children, one of which became an Alabama state senator. In 2002, Henry died of natural causes at the age of 80. So that's going to do it, guys. If you found the secret in today's episode... Hey, man, shout out to Henry. Shout out to everybody in this story. Really. Really. Shout out to everybody in this story. Um, I think this might have been the first time I've heard someone getting surgery and regaining their eyesight. Like, I, I don't think I've ever heard of that. I know people tried, but I don't know if I heard it being successful. Then he lived to be 80 years old, had a family. That's beautiful, man. Beautiful. Man. Brother said, I only had to take it 13 feet. And it feels like 13 miles when you're on fire. Sometimes, like, mentally, mentally, I can say things like, oh, if this was to happen to me, I would do that. That's how I feel mentally. I feel like if I see someone, like, like you know, you're the type, I mean, I'm the type, like, if there's a old lady crossing the street, and she's walking extremely slow, and I'm in my car, I'm the type to get out the car and help her type of thing, right? And, you know, you think about life or death, death situations, like I can mentally say right now, like I feel like I would have do, I would have in my mind tried to do what he did, but I don't know if my body would have responded. You know what I mean? Because you know how some people just freeze under pressure? Because, it, like I said, you can talk to talk, but walking to walk is a, I mean, that's, that's beyond brave. That's like, you know, they got all these movies about these superheroes, but these dudes be the real superheroes, man. My goodness. Hey, appreciate you guys coming over and watching. Shout out to Mr. Ballin. Um, yeah. This was a, I mean, although we had two that passed away, rest in peace. But, mm. all right, man. Peace out.